So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back to our, wow, it's already lesson number four of the uh, AVR uh, reverse engineering and whatever class. Actually, today it's going to be mostly about reverse engineering. Um, great to see everyone uh, uh, coming back. And um, I had an interesting chat this week with uh, one of the folks who is taking this course. Uh, he pinged me on Discord and uh, told me that he's starting to um, use the knowledge that uh, about the AVR architecture to solve some uh, CTF, uh, some CTF challenge, capture the flag, a security challenge using um, AVR. That's uh, pretty cool to know. Um, so um, if you have any uh, stories like that, like what are you doing with this knowledge? Please uh, let me know. I, I love hearing about those uh, stories and your success stories. Um, Mikhail says that audio isn't working. Is it just him or uh, did I just speak to myself this entire time? Okay, thank you, Giver. So Mikhail, uh, problem on your head and uh, hi, Nekati. And uh, yeah, I, I start uh, recognizing the names that, because they are, you are here every, every week. Um, okay, let me share my screen and let's jump into the water. So screen sharing, uh, check. You should be seeing my screen now with the infamous document where you have all those, um, all the stuff we have been doing over the past few weeks. And um, before we get started, I uh, actually uh, let's yeah let's reopen this because uh, I want to start from scratch, not what we had last week. So um, yeah, and let's make the font size a bit bigger. Okay, so uh, one uh, announcement, small announcement about. Uh, writing assembly in Wokui. So now, uh, last week, if you remember, uh, we wrote this uh, max8 function. It's in the document. I copied it into the document. And unfortunately, writing uh, assembly code, we didn't get all those fancy colors that we get when we write uh, Arduino or C code. So uh, I'm happy to announce that from uh, Sometime uh, this week, whenever you write assembly code, you have syntax highlighting. So I added the syntax highlighting to um, this uh, assembly editor. And let me just uh, quickly open the chat because I see there are a few more messages and uh, I somehow uh, don't see them. So where is the chat? It's hidden. Okay. Um, yeah. Why? Can't I see? I don't know. The chat has disappeared. Interesting. Anyway, uh, I will look at it uh, if there are like at the QA session. Um, so uh, a quick recap of what we did last week. Um, we started writing assembly code without um, this uh, ASM statement, and you were super happy about it. And I can see why. Uh, no longer awkward syntax. And compare this to like. I don't think we have it here, but uh, we had like the same version with ASM and it was like uh, four times more lines. Um, and today I'm going to, uh, we are going to learn about two new instructions and then uh, super fascinating stuff, how to actually uh, read the code that the compiler creates and how to debug stuff um, and reverse engineering. Um, okay, so uh, quick recap. Let's uh, just get to the same state as we were last week when we had this max8 function. We need to define it in the C code. And then let's just uh, do a quick sanity and see that uh, it still works. Uh, so max between 50 and 55, that's 55. Uh, so uh, probably it still works. And um, oh, I got a chat back, cool, um, somehow. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, cool, cool comment from Mikhail. There is no manual for this because it's changing too fast. But uh, actually, for th there is one feature I'm going to show you today, and I prepared a manual exactly for you. So I hope that you will like it. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so we have this function max eight. It's pretty simple, and I want to write. Uh, a more complex function, we are going to write uh, Fibonacci. So, uh, you know, Fibonacci is like the sequence where 
uh, Fibonacci uh, n is just uh, Fibonacci n minus one and plus Fib n minus two uh, and Fibonacci of zero is zero and Fibonacci of one is one. And it's basically a, a simple synta a simple uh, sequence that uh, um, I, I think it's very famous for uh, teaching recursion. So um, we know how to call functions. Um, I think we did it last week uh, with uh, the call instruction. So ideally we should be able to create um, a function that calls itself and, um, and uh, calculates the Fibonacci sequence. So let's get started. So we are writing Fibo. And uh, because it's uh, a function, we want the write instruction to return to the color. And we did this last week, uh, but uh, so I'm not going to repeat it all, but we know that uh, if it's get, it gets one argument, uh, it will be passed in R24 and the result is expected in R20, R24 as well, just like with um, max eight. Um, and we also need uh, to tell the assembler to export the symbol so the C code will be able to find it. And finally, we need to declare it in the C code and it takes only one uh, argument. By the way, you can uh, also write the name of the argument. That's optional, but it makes it a bit more uh, readable. It doesn't do anything, just a sort of documentation. So now we have defined FIBO. We can uh, call it. Uh, uh, let's say we want to print the first 10 numbers. So I want to assert to 10 serial print plan, uh, FIBO of I, and let's remove this one. And right now the, the function does nothing. So we expect the arg1 to be the same as the result. So it should bring uh, print zero to nine. Let's see that in action. And hooray, we got zero to nine, exciting or not so. Um, so now um, let's write down a plan of what we are going to do. So uh, we go. We want to call uh, uh, FIBO n minus one, FIBO n minus two, uh, add them, and that's the result. But we also want to check check if n is zero, then return zero. Check if n is one, then return one. So uh, let's start by just uh, dealing with these two edge cases. So uh, it's just compare immediate uh, R24 with zero and branch if equal. Uh, we did, uh, you probably remember this uh, branch table uh, somewhere here uh, from last week. So uh, we want to check if uh, the two registers or the two values are equal, so PREQ. Um, if equal, and then we, we need to define a label, let's call it uh, one, so branch to one, branch four to one. Um, and in this case, we don't really need to specify the return value because uh, it's already in R24. If we have zero, then we want to return zero. So no need to do anything here. And same goes with one, if it's uh, if it, it equals to one, then uh, we just go to red and we return the same value like we did here. Um, nothing too spatial. And now we need to call FIBO with n minus one and FIBO with n minus two. So I, I, I could do like deck R24 to uh, calculate n minus one and then call FIBO. And then I know that I will have the result inside um, R24, so uh, now R24 is just FIBO, shell, uh, FIBO of n minus one. Um, but there is an issue here because now I don't have this uh, input value anymore, this argument, so I can't call FIBO of n minus two. And I could probably copy it to a different register. Let's say uh, I could do something like move R18, R24, and then um, I would uh, just move R24, R18, so copy it back. But there is a problem. And the problem is that FIBO, when I call it again, will override the value of R18 or any other register that I will use. So 
Um, basically, it's sort of a catch-22. I can't use any register because then the recursive, uh, the recursion will override it. So I need to store the value somewhere else. And that's exactly where the next two instructions I'm going to show you uh, shine. Um, I think we mentioned it briefly last week, um, the stack. So um, the stack is uh, just a, a region of data at the end of the SRAM. And whenever uh, we call a function, we actually, uh, when we do call FIBO or any other function, we actually push the, uh, edit the return address uh, of the function into the stack. So the return address written into the stack. And how does the microcontroller know where, uh, the, where to write into the stack? So it has this register called SP stack pointer, which points at the bottom of the, of the stack. And this SP uh, is uh, decremented when we write info into the stack. So whenever we um, write a new, we call a function, we write the return address into uh, the location pointed by SP uh, into uh, the location that uh, SP points at. And then uh, the second thing we do, we just, uh, in this case, uh, a return address is two bytes. So we decrement the stack pointer. So it grows down. Um, and whenever we do red, it just uh, do this. It just uh, copies the uh, current value of SP. So it basically adds two to SP. So uh, to remove uh, the return address from the stack, uh, but like the, the actual return address is still in that uh, memory address. And then it does a uh, PC program counter gets the uh, value inside SP. So it loads the program counter with the value that we stored into the stack. And the stack is very useful to keep track of function calls, but we can also use it to store registers or to store values. So in our case, um, we can just um, call the push instruction, which pushes a new value into the stack. So push R, R24, that will push N minus one into the stack. And then um, if we want to restore it later, we can just pop R24. So that would uh, take the value of R24 and push it uh, and re uh, restore it from the stack. Um, but then there is um, an interesting uh, problem because we just uh, overridden uh, the return value of FIBO because it's in R24. So uh, we can do something like that, move R18, R24. So copy the return value or copy uh, FIBO, copy this into uh, R. 18, and then um, we need to, we, we can push it. So it will be available as for uh, after we call uh, FIBO again. So uh, save FIBO and minus one into the stack. And then finally, uh, we can decrement R24. So now when we popped it, we got uh, N minus one because that's what we pushed. And then when we uh, decrement it, it's n minus two, and then we can call FIBO again. And now uh, we have this, uh, so now we have uh, in R24 FIBO n minus two, and we can uh, just pop the value that we saved. Uh, we can pop it into any register. It doesn't have to be the same. So we could pop it into, pop it into R23, for instance. And now we have, uh, both uh, FIBO of n minus two and n minus one, and we can do add R24, uh, R23 to add these two values. And uh, it's been a lot of code and there is a good chance I uh, made some, um, some mistakes, uh, but let's run it and find out if this works to make it a little bit more exciting. Let's also add the, let's also print the number of uh, the index uh, so uh, index, colon, and then the result. Okay, are you ready? Ready, set, go.
Yep, and you can see it did calculate uh, FIBO correctly, like this is the Fibonacci sequence. And we couldn't have done it uh, with this recursion method if we didn't have the stack. Um, okay, so we could have like used the memory and sort of implemented some kind of data structure like the stack, but it's very convenient to have those instructions. Um, and that's one way to use the instructions. Another way to do it is just, uh, so if you remember, uh, there are some registers in the uh, calling convention that uh, I think, uh, yeah, call used registers uh, that we can modify. So these are registers that we are freely allowed to modify and we use them. And there are some call saved registers that we are not allowed to modify. So we could alternatively do something like that. We could have just uh, used one of those registers to store the temporary values. For instance, uh, R16 is in this range. So we could have done something like push R16 and then we have to uh, pop it at the end to restore it. And then uh, mid function, we could, instead of just uh, pushing and popping, uh, like instead of, for instance, uh, pushing this uh, value, uh, FIBO n minus one, we could have just stored it into R16. And then uh, we didn't need this and we didn't need this, uh, just uh, pop, uh, just, you know, uh, use R16. And this is just a convention thing. Like uh, if we write our own assembly code, we can decide how we do it. But if we are working with uh, Arduino code that is compiled by GCC, then GCC expect us to, uh, to, to preserve the value of these uh, registers. So it's totally up to us whether we want to, you know, just uh, push them at the beginning of the um, function and then use them and treat them as sort of local variables that uh, belong to us, or we can just um, use those uh, generic registers, those um, call clobbered registers. And then whenever we modify them, uh, push them into the stack before we call other functions because we know they can also modify them. So that was FIBO, Nachi. And um, push and pop, uh, pretty useful. And um, ta -da 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 -da. okay, uh, I would love to hear about that uh, clever trick in the uh, Q and A uh, session letter. Thanks, Justin, uh, please. Uh, tell me about it later. I'm curious. Um, and once we uh, have those instructions for me, like I think, uh, let's write it down, push and pop. So for me, there are still a few more instructions that are less common, but I think you have enough instructions to be able to do useful things. And um, what I want to move on to is I, what I think is the more interesting thing are of just seeing the code that uh, the compiler generates when we write C code. So we already know like uh, how to write our own assembly functions and we know to write Arduino code, but would it be, be interesting to see what the compiler uh, generated for this loop, for instance, or even how did it, uh, did, did it, actually write these functions the way we, uh, we rewrote them? Did it modify them in any way? So um, for that, there is a command line tool that can show you this information. It's called uh, AVR Objump. But luckily, uh, if you want, I can show you how to do it in the command line during the Q&A session. But luckily, it's, I already integrated it into Wokwi because uh, that was the first thing I wanted to do to see what the compiler uh, does. And you can just F1 and uh, look for uh, assembly. And you have this co view compiled assembly code listing. And as soon as I hit it, uh, there is a new tab called sketch.lst. And uh, it might be a little bit overwhelming because this is like, uh, 27 lines program, but the listing, oh my God, oh my God, more than a thousand lines. But there are good news. Um, first of all, um, it has comments. So you can see like, uh, for instance, if I want to, do, to see what my loop looks like, I can just search for void loop. 
and hopefully I will find how it compiled. Yep, I can see the, com the, the compiled code for loop and there are like, uh, I, I can see the source code next to the instructions. So I, I know that this like digital write was compiled into these, um, into these two, uh, into these two uh, instructions. So uh, it loads uh, one into R24, which is the first argument and then calls this function. So, uh, because we, we, we asked it to uh, call it with the number one. But then uh, we, we can also already see something interesting. When we call delay the next line, it doesn't uh, do anything with the argument. What happens here? I mean, where is this 1000? Why isn't it uh, uh, loaded into R24 or R25? And um, the answer is pretty interesting. That's how the compiler optimizes the code. It says that we only call delay with 1000. So it creates um, a spatial, we can look for it here. It, can, it creates uh, a spatial version of delay. That's the delay function, but the value 1000 is hard coded. Um, I think that's, that's pretty brilliant. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's 1000, let's, let's check it out if this is really 1000. I think it is FS3EB, 1003. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think um, that there is uh, a, a place where they add three or something like that, not sure. Anyway, uh, that, that, that's pretty brilliant. Like this is how the compiler optimizes the code. So uh, if you, um, if I had something like this, for instance, uh, I added delay i here, so it wouldn't be able to optimize the code and let's update the listing because it wouldn't be able to create a function, uh, a, a version of delay with this. It would, but it wouldn't make any uh, sense to create uh, a version of delay with this value hard coded and another one with, uh, dynamic value. So now if I uh, look at loop, I can see that it, yeah, it actually calls delay and it loads this value when calling delay. So um, th this is like one of the optimizations that the compiler in doing, is doing. And there are many optimizations that, uh, that you can see. For example, um, if you check out this code, this is where loop begins, but there is no return. How comes? Like, uh, this is like a loop, digital write, delay, digital write, delay. And then there is a bunch of instructions after the call to delay that are actually main. What's that? So it turns out that um, the compiler notices that both setup and loop they, 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 they aren't called by anyone or to, to, to put it down more accurately, they're called by the main function. And um, the main function, which you can uh, sort of see parts of it here is a part of the uh, AVR standard library. You can find it on GitHub specifically, uh, I will post the link so you'll have it. Um, so yeah, I will later uh, change the title, but there is a file called wiring.c and that's uh, the main function somewhere here, I think, or not here in init, uh, wiring, oh, main, of course. So there is this main function and you can see that main calls init, which is an internal function of the library, init variant, then it calls your setup and then it calls, uh, it goes into a loop where it calls your loop and then it calls some uh, other internal function. So this, uh, when the compiler sees this, it realizes that setup and loop are only uses, used here. So it inlines them. So what you are seeing here is actually the combination of um, its uh, loop and parts of uh, main, like uh, this serial event run, which we have here, is also inlined into this um, into this very gigantic function, which contains uh, several parts of main, 
And uh, what do we see here? Yeah, you see the setup and pin mode is also inlined here for some reason. I think uh, we only call it once here. So it's inlined. Um, and you can see like it's, where, where, where does main begin? So main begins here. So main includes all these like very long initialization code and the setup and your loop and everything. So that's what a compiler does for us behind the scenes. And now since we actually, uh, we, we can, uh, we know how to read this uh, assembly code, we can see what a compiler is doing behind the scenes. Now um, let's see something else, uh, something fun. So uh, let's pretend I have this loop that goes from uh, zero to two. Let's remove Fibonacci. We don't need it anymore. Um, you know what? Let me just uh, copy it to the document so that you have it as well. Um, that's Fibo. Cool. And um, so I have this loop that sets uh, pin number i to output. And if I go to the assembly code listing, I will be able to see that uh, that was in my setup. Where is my setup? Yep, I can see that this is the source code, but there was no loop generated. It just uh, did something that is called loop unrolling. Instead of doing the loop, it just uh, called those, um, uh, basically did, instead of like doing the loop, it just did something like, uh, as if I wrote uh, pin mode zero and pin mode one. And uh, obviously, if I will put a large enough number, it will stop unrolling the loop. And I want you to try guessing in the chat what this number would be. I mean, at what number it would stop um, unrolling the loop and it would actually uh, create the code for the loop. So someone says 16, Maru. Um, any more guesses? Uh, let's go to three while you are guessing to see if it, al it may already stop at three. We don't know. Random 0, 12. Okay, any more concrete guesses? So the answer for three, it's still unrolling the loop. Uh, where would it stop? I'm waiting for your guesses. The answer for four, still loop unrolling. Let's see what happens with five. So uh, view compiled and still not generating a loop, still no loop. And let's see what happens with six. Finally, there is a loop. So I think Tom W was uh, the closest to the right answer, which is six. Um, finally, you see there is a loop and the loop only consists of like five instructions, but for some reason, the compiler decided that um, five or less should be unrolled. I don't know how the compiler decides on that. Um, but uh, yeah, there is like optimization for speed or for size. Um, I guess it's been optimized for speed, but uh, I can't really like, uh, we can try to measure the speed of uh, this and uh, like we did with the timer and see what's faster uh, if we want to know for sure. Um, one more thing because before we uh, sign off uh, and move to the next subject, uh, just uh, we did this comparison with uh, digital write versus uh, direct post access and no, I just want to show it in practice. So when I write something like this, uh, it compiles to, I think two instructions, uh, where is set up. Yeah, uh, so I load this value into R24 and then an out is instruction that uh, writes to one of the IO registers. So, um, and, uh, if I do digital write instead, let's do also digital write here. Uh, let's say pin five, I want to write it high. And then I will look at the code listing for that. Uh, where am I? Every code listing is totally new. Okay, so we can see like direct port access is two instructions. And in some cases it might be one, uh, depending of it is, it somehow already has this value in another register, it might optimize it to just one instruction, opposed to digital write where we have all of these mumble jumble until here. This is like a digital write. So uh, you can see that it does uh, stuff with um, 
converting uh, ports, not the number to port and register digital pin to ma, blah, 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 blah. And um, if you are curious, you can, uh, again, you can find it here. Like there is, uh, I think inside wiring digital, there is like the definition of uh, digital rights. So you can see all that it does. Uh, it, it has to deal with uh, PWM for some of the pins and uh, uh, clear the interrupts and uh, a lot of fun. Anyway, so um, yeah, so that was it about like uh, looking at the code that the compiler generate and we could go for on it for like hours. It's fascinating stuff, but you know how to do it yourself. So you can just, you know, keep experimenting, trying stuff and seeing what the compiler generates. I think it's the best way to learn. And this is also a good way to see if you are uh, missing any instructions that you don't know. Like, uh, I think we haven't uh, discussed um, LPM, which loads uh, data from the program memory. So uh, if you see an instruction that uh, like in or NPM that we haven't discussed, that's totally fine. Just go to the instruction set and uh, you know what to do there, like uh, how to read this. We, we already done this. Um, so now I want to move on to uh, the topic that I find most fascinating, and that's debugging. And when we have a program like this, uh, you know what? I actually want to use Fibonacci again here. So uh, let's. Um, Maru, that's a good question. Keep it for the Q&A. We'll, uh, I would love to answer that. Um, so uh, we have this uh, serial print len, uh, and we are printing Fibo, uh, for example, of one. So uh, it doesn't recurse, and it should just print one. And now um, we want to debug FIBO. So there is like uh, the break instruction that I showed you and we can use it here. Like we can, for instance, call break here and then call break again here. And that would show us the stack pointer. You see, it's been decremented by one because uh, we push the value of R16. Um, and that's a really bad way to debug. I mean, if we just want to see the values of the registers at a certain point, uh, one or two times, then that's fine. But that's not a good debugging experience. So um, what I'm going to show you now is how to use a tool called GDB, the GNU debugger. And this tool is super powerful and super useful. So uh, you can take this knowledge and apply most of it to any other architecture, ARM, uh, PC, whatever. It's super useful. And I spent the last week making sure that uh, you can run GDB from uh, Wokwi. So um, before that, uh, and you, you can still do that if you want. You, you had to like uh, install and run stuff on your computer and uh, do a lot of stuff um, to get it to work. Uh, it's like uh, 10 or 15 minutes of work, but it's annoying to have to do that uh, when you want to just you know, debug the program. So if you do want to try that at home, uh, I encourage you. Th these are like the instructions, but um, I managed to get GDB to run inside the browser. So now we can just go ahead and type your GDB. And there are two options, uh, debug build and release build. Uh, release build is the optimized code and we will usually not want to debug that because uh, it's harder to debug because of the optimizations. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, you want to debug the actual thing that runs on the chip, so we will use that. Um, and debug build is just uh, without most of the optimizations, like inlining of functions and so on. So if we just want to uh, look at the source code and do stuff, then uh, we'll use debug build. And as soon as we do that, uh, there is um, a virtual machine booted inside your browser. Um, and it runs GDB. It's a tiny Linux uh, that runs in your browser and runs GDB. And let's actually put them side by side. So uh, we get uh, to see both at the same time. And there is uh, a small issue. If I resize the window, I have to quit GDB and it will automatically restart and figure out that the window has been resized. Anyway, uh, you can see it tells me now uh, the, the program is paused, it's not running yet, and it's in address zero. So the first thing I can do in GDB, uh, let me just clear the screen so uh, 
you don't have all these uh, debug prints. Um, I can just type uh, C. So uh, if I type C, it just runs the program and the program is running perfect. But then um, uh, it continues to run and I can't interact with the debugger. Like I can write stuff, but it won't do anything until I either pause the program, which I will do now. Uh, and then when I pause it, you can see where it paused. Uh, in this case, it paused in this memory address in the micros function. We haven't used the, file, the micros function. So whenever like I randomly pause in a place in the program, uh, it shows me like the source code uh, where it paused, but that's not my source code. That's part of the Arduino wiring library that we have seen. There is a nice command that uh, we can use. It's backtrace. It shows us where we are at a program, the call stack. So backtrace tells us uh, we are inside micros that was called from delay, that was called from loop, and we did that. That was called from main. And it also says uh, that the milliseconds, the argument for delay is 420, uh, 493. And we know it's 1000. The reason it says a lower number is because delay is, uh, let's have a look at the source code for delay. You will see, uh, I think it's inside the uh, wiring. Um, you will see uh, it actually updates milliseconds. Um, but uh, we, we don't have to go to the source code. We can ask GDB list delay will show us uh, the, source code, the source code of delay. So we can uh, see, uh, where it is right now. Um, it's uh, showing us, uh, I think it's, yeah, uh, for some reason it has, it has an offset. So I don't know why, but uh, it started a bit before delay. But um, so uh, w whenever we want to uh, run the program again, we can just type uh, C to continue or the word continue. And there are like a lot of commands in GDB. It's very powerful, but there are a lot of commands. And that's why I have prepared uh, today a cheat sheet. Where is that? Yep, a cheat sheet with the most common command like continue that we have seen, or uh, there is backtrace somewhere here. Yeah, backtrace that we have seen and uh, many other commands that we'll cover now or not cover, uh, but you will be able to learn about them. Um, so yeah, there is this uh, cheat sheet that you can use. And let's uh, go and try to debug our FIBA function. So in order to debug our FIBA function, we need to do a few things. First of all, the program is already running. So we can uh, either press the pause button or just control C, uh, control, yeah, control and C. That would uh, be the equivalent of uh, pausing the program. And yeah, it tells us we are, uh, let's do uh, backtrace again. We are again inside delay, inside loop. And the first thing we want to do, um, we want to restart the program because uh, right now um, we have passed the place where FIBO is. So we can do that um, by telling, setting the PC register to zero. Um, and let's have a look. If we type info registers, we can see all the CPU registers. So that's the equivalent of the break instruction that we uh, used and, uh, and seen the value in the console. So we can see all the registers and one of them is PC, which is right now pointing uh, some point in delay. And we can do something like uh, set, let's clear the screen, set PC dollar PC equals zero. And if we do info registers again, we can see that now PC has been set to zero. So we jumped, we forced the debugger to jump to the beginning of the program. That's uh, a nice way to get to the beginning of the program. So right now, if we uh, type backtrace, it will tell us uh, you are like in uh, this address zero at the beginning of program of the program. You can uh, see this here. This is the beginning of the program. And the first instruction is like a jump to um, the beginning of uh, of the code, and we, we can tell it to run just one ins instruction. We can type step i, which would jump. You see, it took the jump, and now it's in this address in underscore underscore init. Where is that? For some reason, it's not showing in the uh, listing, uh, but yeah, 
it's called here Citors end, but it's the same. And then we can just go, you know, instruction by instruction. But um, we, we don't want to do that. We want just to go to uh, Fibonacci. So what we can do, we can uh, tell the code, hey, we want you to do a breakpoint to break before this instruction. So we just write break Fibo and that would uh, place a breakpoint. You see hackaday.s, that's our file, line 16 in this line. Um, and then we can just uh, run uh, the program, continue. And you see it started running, uh, the LED went on for some reason, probably, I don't know even why, uh, maybe it never went off because we sort of uh, jumped to the beginning of the program. And you can see that we are in this uh, push R16 line and um, we can print the value of SP here and see this is the value. And we can also use this instruction and again, like I don't expect you to remember all these instructions that just know that they exist. So uh, you can use this uh, uh, cheat sheet that uh, we have somewhere here. Um, you can use that cheat sheet to uh, recall them. So we can tell it uh, print eight bytes in uh, hexadecimal. So eight hexadecimal bytes. It's really cryptic, I know, like the ASM, uh, starting from the address of SP. And uh, actually hexadecimal is X, you see. Uh, I even get confused sometimes. So yeah, so that's what we have at the stack right now. Six, three, seven C, probably some uh, return address uh, of the function that called us. And then um, if we run the next instruction, so next or next I, we, we see that now it's inside CPI. But if we print SP again, we can see that the value was decremented. So uh, push decremented the value. And uh, R16, I think it was zero, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the value, when we did break before I saw that the value was zero, we can print the uh, stack and we can see that there is um, zero at the top of the stack. Um, yeah, that's the value it pushed to the top of the stack and that's the previous value. Um, SP always points on the next byte of the stack. So uh, this was like, uh, when we printed it here, this was like the next byte to be uh, overridden by push and now push just overrode it and wrote this zero value. And we can just, you know, continue and see that uh, it goes to line 18, BREQ1F and it didn't take the branch because um, it wasn't equal and then compare and BREQ1F. And then if we type next, we can see it actually took the branch. It skipped all this code and went straight into pop R16. So um, that's like the very basic of working with GDB. Uh, to debug assembly code, but it doesn't have to stop here. First of all, let me show you one feature that I think makes an amazing difference. Um, instead of uh, typing all those commands and like seeing where we are in the current uh, function, we can like always uh, list FIBO to see the uh, beginning of the function. Um, or I think we can tell list uh, how many lines to show. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, uh, we can change uh, show list size. Yeah, by default, it will show 10, um, but we can change this default probably we using, yeah, set list size. But um, we can also give it two arguments. Uh, yeah, it's a bit, uh, the font is big, so it's cutting the line, but we can do just like list FIBO 20 or maybe this way. Okay, not sure why. Uh, yeah, it's hard to really help this way, but you can figure it out later uh, to see how to tell it. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, da, 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 da. maybe FIBO plus 10, something like that. Not sure, you can check it out later. Anyway, uh, so that's the uh, archaic way to use GDB. There is a better way, which uh, 
shows you the code in a split screen. And to do that, uh, you need to write, uh, th there are a few ways to enable that. In GDB in general, there are like, uh, you can write a big backtrace, okay, backtrace to like show the backtrace. You can also type BT, you can also type where, they all do the same. So there are like a few ways to do everything, uh, which is a bit confusing. Um, but if you just want this uh, nice feature, one way is to write a layout ASM. And that would show a split screen where on the top you see the assembly source and you can like scroll it and uh, yeah, and uh, see everything that, uh, yeah, GDBT UI, that's what it's called, uh, and scroll it and see where you are right now. Uh, like right now we are in the pop. And then if we uh, do uh, next, or we can just write N instead of next, it will just uh, go to the next line and to the red, and then we can go uh, next again. And whoa, well, now we are in a totally different location. Um, but now this is actually C code. So uh, we can ask GDB to show us a layout S or C to switch to showing us the source code. So now we can see where we are at the source code and I can scroll here a bit with the mouse so you can see, or with the keyboard, you can see now we are inside a setup in this line. Or we can ask it to use a split layout, layout split, and then we see both the uh, source code and the corresponding assembly code. Oh, well, I scroll too much. Okay, yeah. And, um, one thing to know, if you are using that, then uh, you can no longer use the up and down uh, keys to uh, scroll through the history of the comments, uh, or you can if you change the focus. So you can type focus next, and now the focus is on the assembly window, and we can scroll there and focus next again to uh, go to the command window, and now we can uh, just you know, go to the command history. So I find this super useful when you debug code and you want to see actually where you are at. And if I type next, then uh, I will go out of setup and here I am inside uh, main and I can uh, see both the, um, the C code and uh, the uh, assembly code. Now, if I want to go, uh, if I type next here, it goes over loop. So you can see it blinks the LED once and poses. But um, if you uh, want to go into loop, you can just type step and that's like step into. So now I'm inside loop and I can type, uh, uh, type next. And you see when I type next, it skipped all those assembly instruction. But I can also go instruction by instruction. If I do next I, next instruction, then it will just jump one instruction at a time. And uh, since it's next, it just uh, stepped over delay. But uh, I can, uh, like, like I did it before, I can just uh, step into digital right. And here I can also like debug it line by line uh, by typing next at the C code level or next I just to go one instruction at a time. And at any time I can print any of the registers, like uh, let's say I want to know uh, it did something with R30, I can print R30 and see the value, or I can print it with X, that would give me hexa uh, decimal version. And um, the, 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 this is fun. I mean, I can modify registers, I can do stuff like, uh, read from memory, write from the memory. I, I have total God mode on this uh, microcontroller. Um, one fun thing I can do, I can do something like uh, set port B to say uh, port D. So port D is like, wait a second. Okay, so uh, let's set uh, DDRD. So uh, if you remember from the first lesson, DDRD controls uh, the, the data direction of the pins zero to seven, all pins in port 4D. So I can set it to zero FF and then set port D to zero FF and see what happens. All the LEDs are on because 
I just wrote to the register, to the MCU register that controls them. So I can basically, you know, just write to any location in the memory, including registers, and it just works. Uh, not only that, I can even uh, call functions. I can call FIBO24. Uh, and, oh, I need to tell it that uh, FIBO returns an integer. And, ooh, yeah, we had a problem. Uh, with FIBO, what at, what's that? Yeah, maybe 24 was too big. Oh yeah, I think we had a breakpoint there, right? Let's see. So there is info breakpoints, info breakpoints. Uh, yeah, we have a FIBO uh, breakpoint and that's why uh, the debugger uh, stopped there instead of uh, executing the function. Um, so we can delete this breakpoint and then we can try to call FIBO FIBO 10, for instance, and we need to tell it it's an integer. And we can see like, yeah, we can call it from the uh, command line uh, from GDB unless we have a breakpoint. Um, another useful thing we can do, let's say right now we are, uh, actually we are in a strange situation because we are in the middle of FIBO that was called from the middle of digital right. So it might screw up things a little. Uh, so let's just set PC again to zero to go to the beginning of the program and start from uh, a clean state. Um, and then there is another nice uh, function that called advanced, which advanced, which tells the CPU to go until, to run until it uh, gets into another, into the given function, in this case, loop. So advanced loop, uh, yeah, whoa. Uh, I think we are uh, uh, calling FIBO and putting a breakpoint in sort, sort of, um, sort of uh, interfered with uh, GDB. So uh, yes, let's just quit GDB. And uh, yeah, it will just reload. And now let's see, where are we? Oh, wow. Now there is a strange situation with the console. Um, yeah, uh, maybe. Uh. Okay, let's just uh, open it again. That would be the easiest solution. Yeah, so that's the better way to restart the simulation, just uh, restart GDB altogether. Anyway, so where were we? Oh, we were speaking about advanced. So again, we are uh, backtrace at the beginning and uh, we can just tell it advanced loop and it will run the program until the first line of loop. And now let's again uh, do layout. So uh, split to see both uh, the assembly and the uh, and the uh, C code. And we can do something like um, uh, step I to go over the uh, loop function. Step I, step E, instruction by instruction. And it's pretty um, annoying uh, to type step I every time so I can use the short version SI which will do the same or I can just uh, hit enter and hitting enter return will just uh, execute the last command again so that's a cool way to just you know uh, run the program instruction by instruction or line by line if I do step and not step I so it would right now uh, you see it skips a uh, line in the source code every time so um, yeah, so uh, that's another cool uh, keyboard shortcut. Now, um, this is just the basic of GDB where you can set breakpoints, you can step through the program and um, you can do all these things that you probably expect a debugger to do, but it has a lot more to offer. Uh, one of the features that I really like is this uh, dprint function. So, uh, Let's uh, just disable the DUI for a moment. Uh, disable, DUI disable, that would hide the text uh, interface. And dprint allows me to print something whenever uh, the, comp the uh, source code gets to a specific point. For instance, I can say I want to print, uh, every time I, I start loop, I want to print hello loop. And then if I hit continue, I will see that whenever a loop runs, I get this output to the uh, terminal. So basically uh, I can uh, 
see what's going on with how without having to uh, type things or you know set up breakpoints. And we can even make it a bit more, uh, a bit smarter. Let's say we had um, some counter here, and that counter just you no know, increments. And we use this for the delay, for the first delay. So uh, some kind of uh, dump PWM or I don't know what. And uh, let's restart the GDB with a new program. Uh, move it over there. Okay, so uh, now I can do. Oh, sometimes uh, it doesn't work correctly. If uh, it gets stuck here, it gets stuck here. It will print an error message in a moment. Uh, just try it again. Uh, this is still something I'm trying to iron out. Uh, okay, so uh, now we can do uh, something like the print loop, and we can print something like counter and print the value of counter. And then if we run the program, it will actually print the values of counter as the program is running. So we can sort of, oh, it stopped because uh, the screen was uh, over, the screen space was over. So we can actually add debug prints a priori after the, like to the ready program while we're debugging and we can remove them and we can uh, play around with them. And, you know, this was uh, just a quick introduction to GDB to scratch the surface, but uh, there is a lot more to it. I don't know where I put the uh, link. Oh, here it is. Uh, there are like a lot, many other things you can do, um, yeah, like showing um, disassembly of functions and uh, dumping random memory uh, bytes and uh, like, uh, setting registers we have seen that setting uh, variables we can change the value of counter as the program is running um, and um, if you really want to dive into the gdb then uh, i think the best way to do it is to read this very long manual it's very long it's detailed but uh it's good it i, I will uh, just uh, post the link but uh, what you have seen today is probably enough to, you know, get by and start exploring uh, Arduino code and assembly code with GDB. And also it's good enough to be useful for you when you debug your code and you want to know why, uh, like uh, something doesn't work as you want, then you can just uh, set breakpoints or um, st step instructions one by one or use this dprint to print whatever you can like print uh, the value of register instead of counter so like uh, it's not very useful i guess uh, in this context but uh, yeah so we can see that now it prints both uh, the value of uh, r0 and the uh, value of uh, counter so it's not really useful in this context because this is c code and you don't really care about r0 but in your code, you can actually use it to, uh, if you have a function that runs uh, many iterations, that runs for many iterations and you only want to uh, print the values and you don't want to break every time, then you can use dprint for that. And there are like conditional breakpoints. So you can only break if R16 equals to something or like uh, the possibilities are endless. We are like just scratching the surface. There are macros that you can define and it's very powerful. And this version of GDB is a bit, it's like the latest version 10.1, but it's a bit stripped. It doesn't include a very powerful feature which is the Python scripting engine. But if you use local GDB, you can also script it with Python and uh, create um, scripts that will pretty print your data structures and whatnot. So, um, that's a very powerful tool and um, it's very, I think it will be very useful for you when you uh, work on your uh, final project. And uh, before we move to the Q&A, uh, I think that's a good opportunity um, about to tell you that uh, the deadline for the final project, I think you should have received an email about that, but the deadline for the final project is uh, March 21, so the end of March. Uh, so you will have about one month to complete it if you want uh, once the uh, course ends. 
And that's it for uh, today's lesson. And now let's uh, check out the chat to see what we have in the uh, Q&A. Uh, 